So we are to love from pure heart, good conscience, and unhypocritical faith. Why does he structure it this way? It's because above all is love. To have this unity in the faith of knowledge, we are to have love as the roots. Good morning. We will continue off with uh, where we left off last week, which was the purpose, the reason why the letter of Ephesians was written. And I will just quickly go through uh, what we covered, starting uh, with, as a reminder, that Ephesians, the church in Ephesus, was the light to the Gentiles during the first century. After Jerusalem and Antioch, it was used by God mightily to further his word. In the, with the New Testament books, nine out of the 27 books in the New Testament is connected to Ephesians, making it um, just over every three times out of ten. The book is relate, um, one of the books in the New Testament is related to Ephesians one way or another. And I first covered uh, the first point, which should be known and which we should meditate on frequently, is the notion of everything that we have in Christ. And again, <coughs> it's the identity that we have with him, that we can only have with him, that we should have and be aware of with our daily life. The second and third point of Ephesians that is unique to this book I will be covering today, which is um, unity and love. But going off from last week, I will just um, I spent most of my time in chapter one, so I'll quickly go through everything we have in Christ, starting in chapter one. Everything that we have in Christ. Paul opens up with a greeting to Ephesians in 1 and 2, verses 1 and 2, chapter 1. But then he goes very quickly into displaying the Godhead, a breakdown and a reminder to us and to the Ephesian church what the Father has done for us in Christ. In verse 3, it talks about... Um, the spiritual blessings that we have in him, which we can only have in Christ, that we were chosen in Christ. In verse 4, in Christ we were predestined for his, his own son to be selected children to him. This all happened before creation. It happened all in the past. This was an act that we had nothing to do with. We were chosen by the Father to be in the Son. When he sees us, he sees his Son in us. And in, I'll just read verse 5 and 6. Having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Christ, Jesus Christ, to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the, grace, uh, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. In the beloved, in Christ. All of this because we were accepted, accepted because of us being in Christ himself, for Christ and his glory. Because in verse 6 it says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, we were accepted. From verses uh, 7 to 9, we see everything that, we, that Christ did for us that we have in him. We are redeemed, in verse 7, in Christ through his blood, forgiven for all of our sins that we have committed in the past, that we've committed in the present, and all of our sins that have yet to happen, that he knows but he chose and died for us. In Christ, our sins are forgiven in his blood. And we are to repent from that. Because we gave, forgave us in the past, it doesn't mean we should 
not repent. We are still to repent. Why? For since there is no sin in Christ, um, we are not to continue in Christ. Uh, what I mean by that is, is that because we were forgiven in the past, it does not mean we are not to repent today. We are to repent for our sins. Why? Because we love him. We are supposed to walk as him. But we still sin. We still falter. So we're not supposed, we are not supposed to, to continue in sin. If we are to be like him, we are to strive like he did. He, did, he was sinless, so we should try to live our best to not sin ourselves. And Paul states this um, again in 1 Corinthians 7, 24, which he uh, states, uh, Know ye not that they will run in a race, um, uh, in a race run all, but uh, one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all times. We are supposed to continue in the faith, even though we struggle with our sins, because we're not perfect. We are supposed to continue and to run the race as we ought to, following the rules of the race that we have been charged to run. And continuing, uh, now they do to obtain a uh, corruptible crown, but we have an incorruptible. We are supposed to run life, continue life, in a way that does not bring dishonor to God. We are supposed to run the race in an incorruptible way, in a way that sin is not present, not seen. Not seen in the sense we're, we're supposed to say we're perfect, but not seen in the sense that when people look at you, they see Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. They see you as the Christian, not you as the everyday worker or the good friend. They see you being different, different to everyone else. Why? Because, again, we are in Christ. And frequently, um, I haven't mentioned this, but infrequently in Ephesians, um, it gives the idea of walking. To be in Christ means to walk as he did, not perfectly, um, but we are supposed to continue, no matter what happens. Uh, Pastor Rob's been, uh, we've been going through Job. That's what Job did. He went through a life of suffering and trial, but he continued, persisted. And going back to Ephesians, um, in verse 7, we are forgiven. So we are redeemed and we are forgiven. But with that forgiveness and in Christ, we are supposed to be enlightened. In verse um, 8 and 9, we are supposed to be enlightened. We, in Christ, have all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, the mystery being uh, the church. We are supposed to know the function of the church and understand what we are supposed to do in the church and how the church is different from the rest of the world. Why did God create the church, establish the church? Because of this, um, we have been given a future of inheritance. Being So we were redeemed, enlightened, we have... Given that we have been given the knowledge and we have been given a future inheritance. We know this. Future inheritance is our uh, eternal life in him. You only have eternal life in Christ. If you do not have Christ, you are destined, unfortunately, to eternal death in hell, which is the purpose of the church to bear witness to share the good news that we have in Christ. And then uh, Paul mentions the Holy Spirit in 13 and 14, reassuring us that we are sealed by the Spirit, which is referring to us being in Christ, yes, but uh, it is the authentic seal 
It is not a fake. It is not anything else but God choosing, sealing us, protecting us for all of eternity. It is the own, showing the ownership. Us being sealed also means that um, we display naturally the ownership we have in Christ himself. But it also gives us the authority. And what I mean by that is we're not Christ. But the authority is referring to, with the seal, giving us authority, means that we are chosen to be priests and preachers and witnesses. That's the authority we have in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, Paul states, is to protect us. That's the point that he's trying to give us with the reassurance and sealment. He's the one that protects us in Christ. And in John 16, it states that the Holy Spirit is the helper. Right now, the Holy Spirit is with us, sent by Christ to help us. So, with that short introduction... <laughs> We will uh, now get into the second part. So the first part is understanding the knowledge that we have in Christ. Second is to understand the types of unity. Paul uses, in the, in the whole New Testament, the, unit, the word unity is only used three times. Twice in Ephesians and once in Corinthians. I will mention the Corinthians one because it leads very nicely to the third point of Ephesians, which is in love, what we're supposed to do with that love. So, <coughs> in chapter 4... Verse 1 to 6, we have the unity that we have in Christ, which this type of unity that Paul is talking about is talking about the unity that we have in the Holy Spirit, how we are to live with one another. Specifically, um, leading up to this, it's talking about the unity that we have as one body, uh, with Jew and Gentile becoming one. That's the one body. And that's what it's talking about here, is that the oneness and unity that we have is us being together as formerly lost souls, lost spir uh, spiritual beings who knew only sin, who are now able to live righteously. We are to pursue holiness through the blood of Christ. And this is how Paul states that we are to live out this unity with one another. He gives four points at the um, start with verses 1 to 2, how to maintain this unity. How we are to live our life in harmony with one another and how to live in a godly way so our lives, our, um, our lives are witnesses to the rest of the world. How we are to walk the path of righteousness to show that we act and are different. We are new creatures, uh, new created beings in Christ, chosen to share the gospel to the nations. So how do we maintain this? Four points. One is, the first one he mentions, is humility or lowliness. This is a f uh, fundamental Christian virtue. In James um, 4, 6, it states... But he uh, gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud and gives grace to the humble. This is um, referring back to uh, Proverbs 3. And Peter mentions this in his letter in 1 Peter 5. This is also the quality that the Christian is to have, which is commanded by Christ in um, the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. So we are uh, to have, uh, to remind ourselves that we are supposed to be humble and lowly. The next point is uh, gentleness or meekness. The result of the characteristic that we have of humility and loneliness, remembering that we cannot do anything of ourselves, but we have to have the strength of the Spirit and Jesus in us. And we are to reflect and meditate on that as much as we can to remind ourselves how weak we are by ourselves. And again, while we find our strength in unity, we ourselves in that unity builds about strength. The idea of gentleness and meekness is that 
It is a mild spirit. It is one that is self-controlled. Third point of how to maintain this is patience or long-suffering, which literally means to be long-tempered. It gives the picture an idea that it's like a type of metal uh, that takes a long time to heat up and actually uh, become hot and start melting. Or like uh, short-temperedness is when it quite easily combusts. Uh, well, today it's a bit chilly, so that would be long-tempered. It's uh, it's very hard for it to get hot and warm up because of um, the temperature. And the fourth point is how to maintain this unity is to bear with one another in love. From the characteristics above, humility, gentleness, and patience, it ultimately leads to being able to have a forbearing love for one another that is continuous and without condition. And Peter states this in 1 Peter uh, 4.8, telling his audience who were being persecuted during um, the writing of his letter, that above all, keep fervent in your love, persisting in the love that you have for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. And Paul is also referring back, uh, Peter, sorry, is referring back to uh, Proverbs again uh, in chapter 10, verse 12. That's where he's referring to. But why are we to have this unity with one another, understanding that we are supposed to be humble, gentle, patient, bearing one another, helping each other out? What, what's the point? Why are we to maintain this type of unity in the church? Well, there's certain aspects that we get from this unity. And he lists them out um, from verses 4 to 6. The first one out of the eight is that we are in one body, reminding us that in the church we are brought and uh, we are to share of the blessings given towards the Jewish people. The Jewish uh, nation still has their own blessings. But we are partakers of that. Christ will still come again and establish his kingdom. But we are partakers. We share of the blessings given to Abraham and actually fulfilling the promise that God gave to Abraham that um, Israel is to be a light to the nations. That's what the church is continuing to do. It's not that the Jews have been written out. They're going to uh, establish their nation again under the Messiah, which is Christ. <clears throat> the second thing is that we have uh, the Holy Spirit uh, in us now, which is to show that Christ sent a helper, a teacher, that we all share and partake with. It is not a different or we do not have a greater advantage than the believers in the past. It's just a change of office. And this is quite easy to see in Acts 1 and throughout the book entirety. The Holy Spirit's duties changed, but it's not to show us our superiority of the church. It's to show just the change of duties. He, uh, the Holy Spirit was with the Israelites, now he is in the Christians. It's just a change of office. That's the whole point of the signs and tongues and fire. It was just a change of office. The third part is that we are to have a single hope as the believer. But uh, what type of hope is this? The hope that uh, Paul's referring to here in Ephesians 4 is harping on something he mentions earlier with Romans 5, which um, Romans 5, it's uh, talking about the results of being justified in faith alone. And from verse 1 to 5 in Romans 5, it says, uh, therefore, being justified by faith, that's what his argument was before, 
we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have accepted by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not on, uh, and not only so, but we glorify in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which is in us, uh, which is given unto us. The hope that we have is talking about the hope that we are looking forward to see and the hope that we find confidence in with God fulfilling that. It's talking about the promises that are given to us in God himself, which is uh, specifically stated to the Christian. It is what we are expected to see to come. It is connected to the promises, which is earlier mentioned in, um, 11, for, um, in Ephesians 1, 11, 14. It's talking about our future inheritance. That's our hope. Our hope is in our future inheritance, which is to come. When we are glorified, that is the hope that we are to look towards. Because God's promised it, and it will happen. And, um, another verse that uh, connects to this hope that we have, the one hope that we have, is in uh, Colossians 1, verse 23. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which ye um, has preached to every creature which is under heaven, wherefore I, Paul, have made, uh, am made a minister. It is the hope of the gospel that we have in Christ. We are in Christ. And that hope that we have, that we look towards, that we have in Christ, is the future inheritance, which is our glorification that is yet to come. Um, going back, we also have one Lord, one Master, that is Jesus Christ, no one else. He is not second, he's not third, he's first, always and forever. Do we always do that? No. We forget. But we are supposed to be reminded of that as much as we can, so we maintain and remain in that. And we have one faith, which is not blind. Faith is not blind. The faith that we have is not blind. It is, um, a, it is us knowing and sharing the knowledge and insight in the body of Christ that we have being in the church together. This single faith that we are to have is described in Jude verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all dignants to write unto you, of the common salvation, it was uh, needful for me to write unto you and exalt you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. This faith is talking about the knowledge that we are in Christ. Again, it's very important to make sure you identify as a Christian above all else, because that is the reality of the situation, if you identify with something else, it means that that is what you see yourself as. That is what you will worship eventually. The next point that he mentions that we have in this unity being brought together with the Jews is the one, is one baptism. This most likely is referring to the physical baptism being submerged that we share. But what is that type of baptism used for it is used to show a witness it is used as a witness it's a sign it's a symbol of your commitment being in the church and it's our, all of our testimonies are different but we share in that baptism that we all testify one thing what's that one thing that we all have in common that Christ is the only way of salvation you can't do anything you can't earn it he chose you you loved him he loved you before that is the witness that we have. And seventh 
um, thing that we have in common, uh, it, that we are to identify in the oneness, the unity, is having one heavenly Father, one God, which is understanding the knowledge of the most basic uh, principle that uh, is to understand who God is throughout Scripture, not just the New Testament, but through the Old. The same God of the Old Testament is the God now. Uh, one passage states it this way, to you... It, should, uh, it was shown that you might know the Lord, that he is God. There is no other besides him. I think this, uh, Deuteronomy 4 says this quite often. Um, but this statement is one that we share in common, that God is the only God. Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. There is only one way. And then the eighth uh, point is that we have one grace. <clears throat> that is a measure of Christ's gift. So the first unity is that we are, as Jews and Gentiles brought together, are one body and we share in the oneness that we have together. The second use of unity that Paul shows us is in... Um, Chapter 4 again, verse 12 to 16. So I'll just read it. For the perf uh, perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. 13, this is the main point. Till we all continue in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto the perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The unity mentioned here in verse 13 is talking about the unity of faith. What does that mean? It specifically is referring to the body having the truth that is revealed to us being the staple of our walk. It is the Christian teaching, specifically the gospel, keeping in mind the good news, because that's what we are to proclaim, Understand, we are to understand the faith from a knowledgeable perspective. We are to grow in our knowledge of Christ so that we are better tools, better instruments to help and to guide others to salvation, but also to build ourselves up to be more thankful and to grow in our love of Christ. We are to sharpen our skills and knowledge with one another Proverbs um, 27, 17 states it this way, Iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpeth another. We are to sharpen our skills and knowledge with one another. This is the unity of faith. We all agree. We might have some differences, but we want to grow and understand why it is that maybe you think one way and the other person thinks another. But essentially, we have one knowledge, one truth that unifies us. That's what the faith means here, which is unfortunate considering that today that's not really prized anymore. People think you have to sacrifice different doctrines, different truths, different pieces of the Bible to have unity. But that's simply not the case because here it's talking about that we are supposed to have a unity in the same faith. Same faith, meaning same knowledge, same truths. We are supposed to accept that. Does it mean all principles? No. But that is what we are supposed to strive for, to have the same understanding of who Christ is and of uh, doctrinal truth. And, but what's so important Well, about this? Well, Paul talks about this. To Timothy, while Timothy was in Ephesus, Paul wrote 1 Timothy, a letter to his beloved son in the faith, to be cautious of this uh, unity that we are to maintain. And how does he do this? Well, he says it in 1 Timothy 1, 3 to 7, specifically verse 5. I'll read verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart 
and a good conscience and of faith unfervent. And later, uh, what that means is, is that we are supposed to continue from a pure heart to have the same faith in good conscience. And later in uh, 1 Timothy, he talks about false doctrines, false teachers. That's what he's warning about. So we're supposed to have a unity. In Ephesians, we're, we have a unity of knowledge that we're supposed to have. But then later, throughout um, Paul's other letters, he writes that, he then writes uh, First and Second Timothy warning us about false doctrines, false teachers. Again, another way to look at verse 5 in First Timothy 1 um, is this way. Now, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. The goal of our command is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and unhypocritical faith. So, verse 5 is basically stating our command is to love from, so we are to love from pure heart, good conscience, and unhypocritical faith. Why does he structure it this way? It's because above all is love. To have this unity in the faith of knowledge, we are to have love as the roots, which then leads to uh, the third point of the book, the main point in Ephesians, and the main point that Paul makes with his third usage of unity in Corinthians 3, 12, and 14. And again, this is the only other time out of Ephesians that the word unity specifically is mentioned. And what type of unity is he talking about? What brings us together? Verse 12, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, out of bless, uh, mercies, kindness, humil uh, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. So he's going through the list of how to maintain this unity with one another. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man hath a quarrel against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the perfect, uh, which is the bond of perfection. When it says put on charity, it is specifically mentioning love. You are supposed to, above all else, uh, have the perfect bond of unity. All else, have love. Love one another. It's not talking about, uh, it does not prioritize anything else. You can be kind, you can be humble, you can be gentle, you can be patient without love. But if you don't do it from love, you're doing it from another motive. Either love for yourself, maybe direct love to someone else. That's not the point. You're supposed to have the love of Christ that fuels these characteristics that you would see and that will witness to other people. Um, some other mentions of love that is very clear, it can be seen throughout the book of 1 John which is, again, a book that was written in Ephesians. John, uh, 1 John 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 20, uh, 23 and 24, it states, And in, this command, in his commandment that we should believe on the same name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us uh, commandment. And he that keepeth this com uh, his commandments dwelleth in him and in him uh, in and in he in him and whereby we know that we abideth in where we know that he hath abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us it's uh, john is talking about the love that binds us. It is a commandment given to us to love one another. Um, another uh, way to phrase it is uh, 1 John again, uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Whosoever believeth that uh, Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him, that uh, begath loveth him also, that is begotten of him. We are... Christ loved us first, so we are to show that love to everyone else in the church. 
and to others that are unsaved, have a heart for the lost. Or uh, another way is um, what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, and above all things, have fervent charity, have fervent love among yourselves for uh, charity, again love, shall cover a multitude of sins. Love itself is power. And that is what we are supposed to be reminded, that the love that is from God given to us is power itself. And unfortunately, the Ephesian church forgot this. As much as Paul, John, Timothy emphasized love, which in, I didn't mention it, but in the letter itself, love is mentioned uh, six times, talking about the love of the Father towards us, or Christ's love towards us. Eleven times the word love is used, is directed to one another. That the focus of love in the book is for us to love each other. But as uh, Pastor Rob read to us, that's, the church forgot that. They left their first love, which means they were serving something else. If you don't love God and you're not worship, uh, that love is not in worship and in knowledge, that love is not there. Um, that worship and knowledge is not there without love. Because you can have knowledge and not love. You can have unity and not love. The roots of it is love. The greatest damage to the church is unbelievers who were raised in the church, no church doctrine, and use that against uh, young believers. Um, specifically, I'm reminded of, uh, what's his name? Um, oh, it's skipping me. But the, the whole point is, is that the most damaging thing is to the church is non-believers who were raised in the church have the knowledge of Christ but refuse it because they see hypocrisy and other reasons. But... Uh, they have knowledge, but don't love. That's the whole point. We are supposed to love with the knowledge that we have. To fulfill our duties as the church, we are to love. We are to love in unity with one another. We are not to be absent from the truths that bind us together, that keep us together as the church. And that's uh, the point of the letter of Ephesians is that we have the knowledge of Christ that unifies us in one body and what binds us together is the love that we have in Christ to the Lord but more importantly to each other. We struggle in that on a day-to-day basis and that is what we are supposed to focus on. The unity of God that binds us, the truths of Scripture which are ultimately grounded in love.